Hello, and welcome back to Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers, the podcast devoted to exploring the frontiers of psychedelic medicine and mental health. I'm clinical psychologist Dr. Steve Thayer, and today my co host, Dr. Reed Robison, and I are joined by Hannah Cross. Hannah is a licensed clinical social worker, therapist, yoga teacher, and all around awesome person. She has extensive experience treating trauma using a variety of methods, including psychedelic assisted therapy. In this episode, we discuss the exciting ways psychedelics are being used to treat trauma. This is a dense episode. We get a little vulnerable, so brace yourselves, and thank you for listening. All right, welcome back. Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers. Thank you. We got Reed Robison, Steve Thayer, and we're joined by Hannah Cross for the first time. Hannah, do you want to introduce yourself to our audience? Sure. So my name is Hannah Cross. I'm an LCSW and therapist. And you are uh, one of our therapists, but you also have your own private practice, right? Yes. Do you Mm want to shout out your practice? Sure. I mean, my practice is just my own. It's in Ogden under the name of Wild Sunflower. I consider myself a trauma therapist by trade. Awesome. And And a wild sunflower. (laughs) And a wild sunflower. (laughs) By trade, yes. And trauma is what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, Trauma generally, but using psychedelic medicine tools to help people come back from the brink and heal from trauma. And we thought it might be informative to start with sort of a what is trauma discussion um, to talk about the various kinds, how it happens, and then we'll move from there. So folks, what is trauma? And how many different definitions can we come up with? <laughs> exactly. I have a lot that I like. Same. But the uh, first one that comes to mind is trauma is not what happened it's what happens next Mm. Um, meaning it's it's not the event it's your ability to process Mm -hmm. it and the absence of say an empathetic witness to Mm -hmm. help you hold that at the time Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that reminds me you know I started my career as a psychologist in the Air Force I was an active duty psychologist captain in the Air Force and a lot of the folks I worked with um, who had been deployed who had seen action seen combat um not all of them develop what we would call post-traumatic stress disorder even if they had been exposed to what we would probably agree would be traumatic events in fact the vast majority of soldiers marines airmen sailors coast guard members who are exposed to again what we might say is traumatic do not develop full-blown symptoms of ptsd so it's not what happens it's what happens next and I wonder, it, it also is what happened before mm-hmm. what happened. Yeah. <laughs> right? And that's, I think, probably the biggest factor in those that do develop PTSD. Yeah. Do you want to say more about that? Oh, well, I think, you know, I'd like to probably offer a definition of trauma that I like, and I like to read a lot, but trauma to me is just any experience that is so overwhelming that it shuts down our normal capacity to turn an experience into higher learning mm. or to process it. Um, and I think that those that develop PTSD probably did have earlier trauma, maybe not of this kind of stereotypical combat trauma, witnessing death, almost dying, extreme violence trauma, but probably more um, attachment traumas or little t traumas if we want to begin to talk about what those are. Yeah, so the little t trauma versus big t trauma, meaning little t might not be a sentinel event, it might not be a, a, a big Uh, like you were saying, combat, uh, a boundary crossing like a sexual assault or something like that. But it might be unmet needs when you needed the most, Uh, what what we've heard called developmental trauma that you're saying might make you more susceptible to developing a mental illness in response to trauma later in life Mm -hmm. if you were to be exposed to a a capital T traumatic event. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what we do see is that those attachment traumas are much more pervasive in terms of how they affects one's own view of themselves in terms of being capable or safe or important, lovable, cherished, and all of those things, and typically much harder to treat Mm. than something like PTSD from an adult single event trauma. Harder to treat, and I think one of the reasons why is, you know, your emotional circuit breaker, like your emotional... A uh, fuse box gets wired when you're young mm-hmm. as a result of interactions between what you bring into this world in the form of your genetic code and what you have to contend with in the form of your you know, early childhood environment. And so if it's wired in such a way 
because of neglect or because of abuse or those developmental trauma variables that it's really sensitive, then it's easy for the circuit breaker to blow, you know, for, I mean, easy is relative, but uh, when you're exposed to something later in life that would traumatize one person, but might not traumatize another. And it makes sense that it takes quite a while to heal from uh, a long-standing trauma occurring over time. Mm -hmm. Like, I think it's an important point that's coming up that we do need to be patient with ourselves on the healing journey because sometimes it takes time. Mm -hmm. And like Hannah said, you can heal from, you can focus on one event in therapy a little easier or quicker than we can a series of events, especially at a very uh, formative age in the bosom of the family. Yeah. Right. You can't rush that kind of healing. In my experience, I think that that the need for that healing also makes itself known when it's the right time. And for some people, I would say probably for most people, it's not probably until their um, adulthood that they're able to finally look at some of those attachment traumas and understand them, gain insight around them necessary to heal it. Yeah, you need the right conditions of safety mm -hmm. and um, support to be able to do that work mm -hmm. and, and be out of that environment in some ways. Mm -hmm. Right, because a lot of times in the process of healing trauma, what you're doing is you're linking the current safety and the current evidence that I am lovable, for example, back to earlier experiences that are kind of overshadowing the current safety. So, yeah, we're getting into the how we might heal trauma. Do we want to back up a little bit? Because yeah. we all have a Let's lot of things we want to say. do some more definitions. <laughs> yeah. I know we have a lot of things we want to say about how we go about healing it. Um, so we're talking about capital T and little t trauma. We're talking about developmental trauma versus, um, you know, some kind of large event that might happen in our adulthood that can trauma to traumatize and we wire, rewire us. Any other ideas about how we might define trauma? Well, I, I really like what Hannah added to it. Uh, we're adding layers to our definition here. If it's not what happened, what, it's what happens next. And trauma is the inability of, of the nervous system to process it at the time. Mm -hmm. Because of the resources you have, like in or around you. And so trauma really is not the event, it's a nervous system situation. Mm -hmm that takes you way out of your uh, window of tolerance. Mm -hmm. um, and that, uh, you know, and that is so variable but between people or among individuals. We were talking about those who go on to get PTSD. I think uh, I saw a paper the other day that said 60 plus percent of us had, have had a significant trauma. And the number could be a lot higher depending on how you define it. But only 10% of those go on to develop uh, formal PTSD per the diagnostic criteria. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, PTSD as a mental illness is rare, uh, but I mean, it's compared to how many of us have been exposed to a traumatic event. Mm -hmm. So we all have trauma healing to do, mm -hmm. even if we're not meeting a diagnostic criteria for PTSD. Right. Yeah, I like to say if you are born in a people suit, you have trauma. It's mm -hmm. just part mm -hmm. of this life. Overwhelming experiences that result in rigidity, right? So rigidity of thinking. So thought yeah. patterns like I'm not enough. I'm not safe. Um, I'm not okay. I can't trust. But also rigidity in um, nervous system responses. Mm -hmm. So reactivity. Um, even dissociation can become a habit as a yeah. result of trauma. Uh, I like the rigidity point because it's also rigidity in the body. Like mm -hmm. if you were punched in the gut, you're going to constrict your gut to protect your vital organs. And the same thing happens in tension in the body and in the mind. Yeah, we, I mean, you, you hear this book quoted often in reference to trauma, but Bessel van der Kolk's book, The Body Keeps the Score. I mm -hmm. just love that title. Yeah. I mean, it, it teaches, the title itself teaches a lesson mm -hmm. um, that we see so many clients with sort of, uh, what's the right word? vague somatic symptoms you know my head hurts all the time mm -hmm. my stomach hurts i have uh, chronic fatigue or something like that and um, while there might be physiological um, causes to these symptoms a lot of times they're trauma locked somewhere in the body yeah and yeah, we're all like 
pressure cookers in a way. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are lots of analogies for it, but you've got all this pressure, tension stored, and it's going to spill out in different ways if you don't let it out consciously through, say, shaking out in the fields if you're a wild animal or, or expressing it through movement, uh, writing, whatever that may be, that outlet is for you. It's going to come out in some other way, yeah. um, whether it's mental or physical symptoms. Mm-hmm. Well, and it can be confusing, right? Because maybe as an adult, cognitively, you know um, that you deserve love, right? You might understand that concept. Like, yeah, everyone deserves love. I'm an everyone, so I deserve love. But your body, your yeah. nervous system was trained when you were young, and it hasn't had a firmware update. And so it still thinks you don't. So there's this internal conflict. So you, you're you constantly seeking love, but then when somebody shows you love, your body rebels mm-hmm. and you get anxious mm-hmm. in the presence of love. And so you self-sabotage. And then then you're you know talking to your therapist about, why do I keep doing this? Why do I keep defeating myself? Well, it's, you've got these competing parts that uh, you know were uh, trained at different times by different things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I first started to see that, I think, the most when I was working in juvenile justice services with these kids that just had so much neglect, um, so much attachment trauma. And you could be looking at them in the eye and be like, I love you. You're so awesome. I believe in you. And they just, they hear almost the opposite Mm -hmm. as a result of their trauma. Like they're hearing, I'm not lovable. Right. I can't do this. You're lying to me, Hannah. Yeah. Or their fight or flight system that was designed to protect them by evolution or God or whatever you believe is going off at the wrong time, you know, be wrong, meaning this is a genuine expression of love and affection from you. Um, but because of like you described their trauma early on, it's, it's signaling danger, danger. Yeah. Like this can't be true. Don't let yourself get sucked in. The wires got crossed. The alarm bells are ringing all the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The, there's this, uh, Uh, saying about trauma or the three E's of trauma that it's the event the experience of the event and then the effects of it what happens next Mm -hmm. that I like to look at as well when defining and looking at what are the consequences Mm -hmm. yeah and you know I'm really having a hard time not talking about what we do (laughs) about TL trauma because now I'm thinking of cognitive processing therapy a Mm -hmm. a specific kind of therapy um, used to treat PTSD, and one of the main interventions is to help people with that middle E, like the way they experience mm-hmm. the event. Yeah. So you go back and you reinterpret the way you had interpreted the event before. So if this is survivor's guilt that's keeping you deep in your trauma, you know, you reinterpret what it means to have survived when maybe your battle buddies didn't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think the intervention of EMDR will also do that. Um, just kind of organically that happens in an EMDR session where someone will remember experiencing a trauma in this very narrow way, like very much laser beamed in on the distress. But as they begin reprocessing that trauma, there's this zooming out effect that you can see where they are now able to experience it or remember it in this way where they are able to go, okay, even though this was really distressing to me here, I still had these other relationships or these other experiences, let's say in in childhood, that were really fulfilling or felt really safe. And so they, you know, walk out of that session having remembered it a completely different way, seeing the big picture of it. Yeah, helping them connect the dots. I think it was was Steve Jobs who said that uh you can only connect the dots looking back. You can't connect dots looking forward. So you, you, you yeah. that sounds like EMDR helps people look back and maybe see dots that they didn't notice before. Sure, or look back in time where they're able to go, okay, that experience actually shaped me to become this person that I am today um, in all of these positive ways. Yeah. Giving some value to the trauma. I mean, that's... I know I'm skipping ahead to the healing, but we might just start want to start talking about uh-huh. that. <laughs> and you can't uh, you can't really separate it because you know it is a a journey, uh, a process of peeling away layers, and it's never really complete. We're always you know experiencing stress, trauma, shame, other wounds, and we're always doing more healing work. Um, and that narrative part of it is is key, I think, on the healing journey. Uh, both in the mind and in the body, because we get stuck in this 
you know, trauma narrative or victim stance, uh, rightly so, to protect ourselves at the time, but then on the path, the path back to wholeness, it's a matter of rewriting that or that maybe a radical shift in perspective mm -hmm. that uh, helps you see it in another way. Mm -hmm. And I think having compassion for ourselves and for our clients who are working to shift that narrative is really important because like you referenced, Reed, the the story as it stands has served a purpose, a kind of purpose, right? To protect them, even though it's been a pretty sharp double-edged sword. So when you're trying to help them reinterpret what happened to them or help them sort of put down their weapons of war and let and allow themselves to be vulnerable again, um, we need to honor that that process could be very, very challenging and that they might not believe yeah. that they ought to do it uh, without some time. Mm -hmm. And just like in any parts work, um, you need to love and be compassionate towards that part of you that uh, created a wall to mm -hmm. protect you from those threats at the time. I mean, it's a, it's a very intelligent system we have to protect ourselves from these traumatic uh, attacks that we get through life uh, and our ability to heal through that inner healing intelligence or the taking down of the walls. Mm -hmm. You know, that reminds me, um, I was watching our colleague Adele LaFrance do a therapy session, um, a ketamine-assisted therapy session. This was an integration session with somebody with a severe eating disorder, and she was working on this concept of this child part, this child self that uh, had developed this strategy to stay safe, and mm -hmm. it was restrict food intake, you know, it was be very, very self-critical. And she coached the client um, to extend love and care and affection to this part and to tell her, hey, um, you don't have to stand guard anymore. Look around you. The war is over. That this part had, had been, you know, still holding tight to her weapons mm -hmm. and standing guard um, because she thought she was still fighting a, a battle that she needed to fight. Mm -hmm. um, so having the adult higher self approach this younger part of her and say, I've got you. You know, I love you. Thank you for your help, but you don't need to do this anymore. And it was powerful. It was powerful yeah. work to watch. I think that's a good example of why it's important to integrate multiple modalities of therapy. You know, EMDR tends to go right to the target trauma, um, and sometimes we need to maybe pull in another modality like IFS or some form of parts work to get permission from those protective parts to even go there. You know, I think I hear a lot of clinicians say that they. You know, they've tried EMDR and they just get stuck because these, defensive sh these defenses show up in the session. Um, it's important to work with those defenses, I think, first before we can get to the trauma we need to, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. And different ways of working with those defenses, uh, including medicines, sure. right? Like MDMA being the ultimate example, ketamine and others. But, but uh, even with those, a lot of skill building and resources often found in the body to be able to go there or touch into that that uh, place of potential panic and distress um, and be able to self-soothe and do the work and go bravely into that uh, healing work. Mm -hmm. Right. And you mentioned MDMA. And for our listeners who are interested in psychedelic medicine, I assume that's why you're listening to Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers. Um, you've probably heard the exciting results, phase three studies from MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, about MDMA-assisted MDMA psychotherapy for PTSD. Um, but remember, it's not just the MDMA. MDMA is not a panacea. It's not a miracle drug necessarily. Like Reed alluded to, there's a lot of skill building and a lot of supportive therapy. These people are getting... How many sessions? 45 hours of therapy uh, with three MDMA dosing sessions. Exactly. So the MDMA itself allows access, and maybe, you know, we could each talk about what we know because it's not, uh, it's kind of this exclusive group of people that's, that have been able to work with it above ground and then a lot of really wise people that have worked with it below, quote unquote, mm -hmm. below ground for decades. But um, MDMA, as I understand it, allows... Uh, it allows you to access those parts, those protective parts, with fluidity, self-love, understanding, and presence that is really, really hard to do otherwise. Mm -hmm. Am I kind of getting that right? Yeah. yeah. It creates this safe container 
within and around you uh, to be able to go towards those negative affective states, those distressing places, traumatic memories, without going immediately into full-blown fight-or-flight mode. Right. right. It, it helps someone transcend the fear of that process. And neurologically, and you can correct me if I get this wrong, Reed, what, what, I th- what we think it's doing is you've got this really unique mixture of neurotransmitters that, that aren't typically present together the way they are with MDMA. You've got some oxytocin present with dopamine and serotonin. So you've got these like love neurotransmitters with the presence neurotransmitter and the desire for more neurotransmitters all there uh, at once. Yeah, I could which, be this, but. which is why it's in a class of its own as a psychedelic, as an empathogen. Mm. You know, there are qualities of that in other things like ketamine, ayahuasca, um, and trauma work you can do with a lot of different medicines and without medicines, of course. But there's nothing I've ever seen that's as powerful medicine-wise in healing from trauma as MDMA. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and... Um, I just can't underscore it enough, the work, the therapeutic work that needs to be done. Because I know a lot of people get really excited about psychedelic medicines and then they'll go off on their own and and try a bunch, which, you know, do whatever the hell you want, people. Um, There's a a lot of healing has been done outside of the Western medicine therapy room with psychedelic medicines. But um, I, I really think that trained mental health clinicians, medical professionals bring a lot to the table when we have uh, these theories of change and help that we can then add to the miracles that are these medicines. Mm -hmm. Because trauma work is difficult work and it shakes things up. Sometimes you feel worse before you feel better. It can be really disruptive along the way Mm -hmm. and uh, you need to shore up all the supports possible uh, and all the skilled help to navigate that in in a really productive way. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, along the lines of skilled help, um, Hannah, you mentioned EMDR. Is that the primary modality that you use when you're helping people with trauma? What uh, what do you do? I would say that's probably my foundation is taking that bilateral stimulation component from EMDR, which just seems to open up processing and speed it up a little bit. Um, but I use I use quite a bit of parts work in the work that I do too, mm-hmm. especially when there's some stuckness happening with that. And I, you know, obviously appreciate um, ketamine's assistance in helping to lower those defenses and move along trauma processing. You know, I really think I've seen people make progress in probably five weeks um, in their reprocessing with me. You know, in the therapy room um, because they're getting ketamine treatments five weeks compared to five months I was going to say Hmm. yeah yeah a therapy accelerator yeah it it really is I mean especially when those defenses um, those defenses are in place it's really it's hard to get to the wounds Mm -hmm. when all these protective parts you know they're they're the troops coming in to prevent someone from going where they need to go yeah for good reason is, yeah, I was going to say for a good reason, and yeah. I've, I've talked to an IFS therapist who um, was a little skeptical of ketamine because she was worried that um, it would artificially well kind of throw the protective parts, the firefighters, mm-hmm. into the cellar and lock the door, mm-hmm. and that after ketamine wears off, they come out and you have some kind of rebound uh, defensiveness. Mm-hmm. So what's been what's been your experience, folks? Well, that's really ketamine? interesting. I, I haven't quite seen that. You know, in fact, um, ketamine can reveal protective parts. You know, they don't necessarily get locked away. I'm thinking of one one gal that I had where her anxiety really showed up both visually and somatically in her ketamine experience as this kind of yarn ball of worry. You know, and so it was more present for her to look at from this um, compassionate yet unblended, meaning separate or mindful perspective. And then she could start a conversation with it and let her know, I'm no longer a 16 year old pregnant in a really re- religious family. Like, mm-hmm. I don't have anything to be afraid of now. I don't, you know, I raised this beautiful daughter. I'm okay. I'm safe now. Um, and so that anxiety could soften. And then we could do some work with that 16 year old part, you know, that felt like it was split in half. So I don't necessarily see um, those protectors being locked away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can understand where the 
question comes from, but I would agree these medicines create an expanded awareness and often help you see the parts. And the work, uh, once you get into it, um, isn't that complicated as far as like reparenting, loving yourself back to wholeness, but uh, you just haven't been able to go there yet, rightly so. Right. And then once you can, and, and once you feel that or experience that in an embodied way, then uh, that's a radical shift. Mm -hmm. And that can, be, that can be very lasting, just like we were talking about in the MDMA literature. You have the vast majority of participants in that recent study, just like the other studies, no longer meet criteria for PTSD, and that lasts six and 12 months later. Yeah, close to 70%. I mean, that's effectively a cure for PTSD. That just doesn't exist. Yeah, it's an treatment. exciting uh, milestone in psychiatry. Assuming that this gets approved, it'll be the first medicine approved with therapy, for one, mm -hmm. but also the first uh, medicine uh, approved that's a curative approach instead of just treating the symptoms. Like, what do we have approved to treat PTSD right now, like Paxil mm -hmm. or something like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like to maybe give another anecdote to an answer to your to your question um, to kind of go off of reads, I think what you were saying is that if you can access that self energy, that compassionate place of openness and courage and safety that you haven't been able to get to before, and you come back to your protectors and they can, your inner protectors, you know, your defenses, yeah. and they can see that in you, then they can soften. You know, so yeah. it's not about pushing them away, it's just about that those parts of ourselves that are um, more protective, um, gaining trust in. And you know a true self. Mm -hmm. um, I had you know one lady who um, she had lost her daughter. You know, and they were extremely close. Her daughter died in childbirth, and this client of mine was also a cancer survivor two times over. So lots of trauma. Saw her daughter die, and then took over care of grandbaby. Mm. And this was, she came to see me maybe, maybe a year after this horrible thing happened. And she was coming to me because other people were telling her to go to therapy because she had appeared numb, right? So she had a very um, dominant numbing defense in place. And it was concerning to other people. You know, she hadn't cried once over losing her daughter. So she has a psychedelic experience during which she sees daughter rise above her dead body and say, Mom, I'm going to freeze you for the next year so that you can take care of my child. Mm -hmm. And immediately that opened up, up the grief for her. So she could go to that wound. She just started crying, but it didn't feel uncomfortable to her you know, to actually grieve here. And she didn't need that defense anymore. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, she wasn't pushing away the numbing. She required it for quite a while. But with the help of that spiritual experience, that psychedelic experience, that defense was no longer needed and she could access the grief and process it, move on, no more depression, you know. Yeah, so it sounds like um, psychedelics, ketamine, psilocybin included, instead of hiding or suppressing, they are uncovering and revealing, right? They're revealing the higher self, as you call it. This um, goes by lots of different names, right? The inner healing intelligence, but, um, and certainly you can use substances to suppress and hide from yourself. But in this therapeutic context, we're using these substances to help, like I said, uh, uncover, excavate, and, and reveal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the help of a guide can be really essential in that. I think psychedelics probably um, don't always necessarily reveal, but a, a guide might help direct someone back into their body. Mm -hmm. um, or even, you know, in another MDMA session that I've heard about, um, the participant could not feel um, her legs. So couldn't, couldn't feel her legs, the guide kind of intuitively said, where are you feeling energy in your body? She said, my whole upper body is totally lit up, but I can't feel my lower body. And then the guide was able to step in and facilitate somewhat like a, of a TRE. I don't know if you've heard of, of that kind of practice, I practice with her. Know. So yeah, it involves, um, it's, a, it's becoming more widely known for the treatment of PTSD. It's trauma release exercises, and it's a somatic practice that involves um, tremoring 
tremoring. Mm. So the nervous system actually creates this kind of spontaneous tremoring in order to release trauma. So, so during this particular MDMA session, the guide helped move the energy through to the legs by pulling in just a brief TRE experience. And that is actually what took the participant to the trauma. It was a childbirth trauma mm. that needed to be healed. And she didn't know that, you know, she, she wasn't aware that that was actually this thing that, um, she had kind of locked away and was affecting her body. So I think psychedelics, yes, but especially with the assistance of a guide yeah. to reveal rather than suppress. Now that you describe that, I have seen video of that done with cannabis, actually. Yes, yep. More people are using it with cannabis. Yeah, yeah. and cannabis might, for some people, ac actually spontaneously induce that tremoring response. Mm -hmm. It's a release of stress. This fascinates me so much. You know, my, in my early training, it was more cognitive behavioral. So uh, we were talking before we hit record, like mm -hmm. I'm very much a cerebral person, um, sort of disconnected from my own body, but now becoming, as I've developed an interest and some expertise in psychedelic assisted therapy, so much more interested in the somatic work and how body gets locked in our body, or how body, how trauma mm -hmm. gets locked in our bodies and in our nervous systems. I was talking to a, um, a body worker, a massage therapist, who said that commonly they have the experience where they're working on a person, they'll find a place this nexus of tension, and as it releases, mm -hmm. there's an emotional purge. Mm -hmm. The person just starts yeah. weeping on the massage table. We see that in the yoga practices as well. You know, I, you're a yoga teacher as well, mm -hmm. aren't you? And yeah. uh, you see that, you know, I, I remember hearing people talk about how emotions get trapped, or and you don't really experience, you don't really appreciate it until you see what can happen as you release tension in different parts of your body, like, um, you know, whether it's the hips or the psoas or wherever you uniquely hold tension, it can be so liberating to approach it from the body, which is our vehicle for ex experiencing the world. Yeah, when you said wherever you hold tension, I just, my shoulders just <laughs> drop a little bit. <laughs> if there's this guy on TikTok, <laughs> <laughs> that every time I swipe and he shows up, I'm like, oh, it's this guy. I love this guy. And he, he starts every little TikTok with like, you know, hey, everybody. And it's something like relax the flesh around your eyes, drop the tongue from the roof of your mouth, which is some, a cue that I had never heard before. But then I was yeah. like, you know, opened up my palate. I was like, oh, yeah, that's actually kind of relaxing. Yeah. I have so much to learn. You guys need to teach me. You hear that <laughs> in yoga a lot, the, the tongue and the palate one. Mm -hmm. Really? Is that a vagus nerve thing? Maybe? I'm just making shit up. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. But it, but it certainly is something that you know just directs your awareness to something in the body that maybe you weren't connected to. Yeah. I've had yoga teachers tell me to Hannah, your face is not helping you do this posture, <laughs> right? And like yeah. facial expressioning into a posture. But mm -hmm. I, I <laughs> am notoriously one of these store emotions and experiences in the body um, type people, mm -hmm. uh, very much so. So I will go to the doctor and get all the tests run because I would like to know why I'm having these stomach aches and it would be nice if there was like a quick fix kind of thing I could take an antibiotic for but um, in my experience most of the time it's like oh this is grief you mm. know and massage and yoga and Reiki have helped me personally access that there's this phrase I like from this book called the search for serenity it's a it's an addiction recovery book, but um, it's called, it's a, there's a chapter called Barometers of the Mind. Like our body is a barometer of what's happening in our oh mind. God. And I've, yeah. I've found that to be totally true for myself. I think yoga is probably the best way for me to access that. There's this one yoga teacher in Ogden who gets me every time where, for whatever reason, the space, the container that she creates and the series that she sets up, almost every time in Savasana, the tears come. Um, and it's like, um, here's an openness for me to kind of hold a hurt part of myself. Yoga can definitely create yeah. that. Yeah, and the barometer of the mind thing is spot on for me too, especially the breath. Like, it's, it's probably a unique thing. Like, like you're saying, we can see it uh, in different ways and it's a little different for everyone. But when I would step onto my mat uh, and begin a yoga practice and just start with breathing, I could tell if my mind is settled uh, even before I get into that uh, by how my breath is. If my breath is uh, shallow and 
choppy, then I know, you know, there's some stress going on beneath the surface. But if it's deep and slow, and then, uh, you know, it's a reflection of what's going on in my nervous system. But the beauty of it is, is once you take control of the breath, like the breath, the diaphragm is this unique organ where it's either on autopilot or you can take conscious control. You know, it's harder to do that with other organs. Right. Like with your heart, some people can learn to slow it down a bit, speed it up. But but if you take control of your breathing, it's like the brain, the brain's remote control. Uh, you start breathing slow and steady and sh- everything else uh, follows suit. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's an amazing uh, kind of window into those, uh, what's going on in your nervous system. Reminds me of those studies they did with um, fa- the connection between facial expressions and emotion. So they had participants yeah. hold pencils in their mouths, either um, elongated so that they were mimicking a smile motion. They didn't tell them to smile. They're just flexing the muscles that are normally involved in smiling by holding this pencil or by holding an eraser first so that their you know lips are pursed. It's more of a, a frown motion. And then they had them rate their moods, and there was a correlation. You know, when they were flexing the smile muscles, they generally felt happier. Yeah, because it's, you know, the form matters. The, this whole embodied approach to healing from trauma is a big deal, and in my opinion is a key resource to use in the healing journey because if you take on the position of depression, your mood will follow. Or if you, like, imagine yourself stepping into a superhero suit or in a powerful stance, you feel that way. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we do that with our clients uh, to illustrate it, and it's, uh, it's striking. And that means we have at our disposal this resource to be able to uh, tap into, to access whatever it is we need in the moment for uh, resilience or for strength. So there's a good reason why we recommend things like meditation, yoga, exercise as integration activities. When mm-hmm. people are, have completed ketamine therapy, um, you know, we, we have another episode, by the way, if you want to look at our website mm-hmm. on integration of a psychedelic experience. But um, it, it, it really, it sounds like correlates and coincides with this body focused approach. Yeah, I'd like to throw out another modality of a body focused approach that I love and trance dance. Have either of you done a trance yeah. dance before I blindfolded? Haven't, I haven't done it. I've heard about it. So I've been facilitating them. And oh, cool. Yeah, and it's a blindfolded experience, which helps because there's a sensory deprivation aspect where you can really connect with what's going on in here. Mm-hmm. And then you're also not having to deal with the insecurities of people seeing you move. Um, but it's it's so beautiful. Just like with psychedelics, that same kind of inner healing intelligence shows up for people when they're in this trance state, listening to their body's impulses and then honoring that through movement. So I kind of frame it like, it's this is your chance to become friends with your body. You know, mm-hmm. open up this line of communication between you and your body so that you can honor it as it's telling you how it wants to be expressed. Mm. And there's usually a pretty powerful emotional release associated with it, um, as well as even some, you know, visuals or experiences of accessing parts. I had one girl recently that shared that the whole time she was just a little girl and she was mm-hmm. like, you know, playing and she was hiding behind these columns in the room. There were no actual columns in the room and kind of peeking out behind them. And it was cool for her to access that. Her intention, by the way, was to create more playfulness in her life. Mm-hmm. And you know, that may have come from uh, the time in her life when she stopped feeling able to freely dance and express herself. Because we see that so much in helping people heal from trauma or from eating disorders or whatever it may be. It's just our society all too often creates these conditions of kind of fear and shame where we lose those creative joyful expressions. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's amazing to see them come back when you create the conditions. Like so many of us are afraid to dance in this culture. Uh, not, Not everyone, but it's, I love seeing like in an ecstatic dance type situation where the right uh, ground rules are laid out where you're not going to feel judged Mm -hmm. or as scared and you can finally tap into that. It's amazing to see people light up uh, when they've 
gone back to something they've lost for decades. Man. Right. And like, we may also talk about um, not only the joyful impulses that we've suppressed, but also the appropriate expressions of anger that yeah. are often suppressed <laughs> through yeah. trauma, right? Mm. So a lot of times the impulse at a time of a trauma, let's say, was one to set a boundary. I needed to set a boundary, but I couldn't because I was too afraid. And so I suppressed that urge to do so. Maybe that urge was to hit. You know, somatic experiencing as a therapy modality asks someone to finally honor those impulses that were suppressed at a time of a trauma mm -hmm. by inviting movement, like conscious and mindful movement to release those urges. And this is different than just pure catharsis, right? I know that some of the research around catharsis treatments where like you're just going to scream into this pillow uh -huh. or you're going to go to a room and break dishes suggests that it, it doesn't really lead to long-term like really, really good long-term outcomes, just mm -hmm. the, just the cathartic purge of energy. But if you're, it sounds like what you're saying, if you're doing this with intention and self-awareness, this is your body's sort of expression of something that it had locked away yeah, because of shame. coming home to it, yeah. reconnecting with it. And the, one of the reasons why I would say it's not just a cathartic experience is because a lot of times when someone has that somatic experiencing, um, you know, to move through some anger, as that anger is processed, they immediately go into the processing of another emotion. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily, you know, a feel good emotion. It may be something like grief um, or sadness or maybe feeling violated, the actual feeling of being violated. Yeah. You may have some cathartic stuff to get out of the way in doing this work, though. I've certainly seen that in many people during ketamine therapy, but also experienced it my first ever ayahuasca experience, uh, like half an, hour, half an hour after I drank the medicine, I just started crying. And the interesting thing is, I didn't know why. There weren't any kind of conscious reasons for the tears. These felt like unshed tears that I had uh, bottled up mm. from you know, doing the work we do and being good at emotional interrupting in the culture we live in and how many of us are raised. Uh, but then, you know, it, it, that didn't happen the other times because I think for me it felt like I just had this uh, this big reservoir of unshed tears to get out of the way before going to some of the other work. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that, Reed. It, it makes me think of ayahuasca and the purge, right? Usually when you hear about ayahuasca, you think, oh, I'm going to puke. That's the purge. And it's, it's a purgative. You're supposed to purge, whatever. But um, there are many ways to purge in ayahuasca. Crying be one of them, laughing, dancing, shitting, some people. <laughs> Yawning. <laughs> yeah. Yawning. Yeah. Spitting. Spitting. Yeah. I actually had a client um, who felt this urge to spit after her ketamine session. Mm. And we were reprocessing a trauma in that psycholytic period, and she spit in my trash can. Um, and it was pretty cool. Yeah. yeah it helped. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. The, the way energies get locked up in us and the way we need to move through them, work with them, and purge them. Yeah, in, in trauma, uh, on the healing journey, there are these, uh, well, these unmet needs that were often um, not, uh, well, they weren't met at the time, like safety is one we've been talking about, love and connection. And then another one is uh, self-value and your voice. Mm. You didn't feel like you had that agency or expression. Identity. Yeah. So that's, a, yeah, reclaiming your identity after trauma is another key uh, focus of the healing work, I think. Yeah, and the tendency for a psychedelic journey to show you a part of your identity that you have become disconnected from, I think, therein lies the healing potential locked inside psychedelic journeys. And, and that usually, it seems, that that part that they tend to show you is a higher self or it's mm -hmm. a repressed self. Um, I'm glad you brought that up, Reed, reclaiming your identity after trauma. Because a lot of people that come to us for treatment are so confused about who they are, they don't even know what they want a lot of times because they're disconnected from the self that would know what they want or how they want it. Because it, especially in many of the traumas, you, you didn't feel like you had a voice. Mm -hmm. A trauma might have been, you could be a, a kid growing up in an environment where whether it's within your family or your community or your religion, um, you didn't feel like you could say, 
no, that isn't right, or that isn't consistent with, you know, my beliefs or my values or my boundaries. Um, but then as you do the healing work, it is an important therapeutic step to step back into your power, you know, reclaim your voice and practice that in, in various ways. In addition to finding, you know, who you really are and the other identity layers to reclaim as well. Yeah, and to self-validate, um, which is something that when you have a, trauma- a traumatized upbringing is really hard to do. To to say like, okay, I am valid, and I'm even valid when I don't or don't really know what's going on or who I am yet. Um, you know, to kind of show your work, so to speak, mm-hmm. and to be okay with that. I think is part of the healing process as well. Um. Any thoughts about how we, you know, we work with ketamine primarily to um, to treat trauma. The other medicines are in the pipeline. We're excited for when they're <laughs> FDA approved. But maybe some ways that you have used ketamine, Hannah, to, to treat trauma. I, I feel like it works pretty good with um, some of the EMDR techniques that we use, you know. Um, People can't always make sense of their ketamine experiences. Mm -hmm. And you can maybe chime in on what you've seen too with this, um, because I've just kind of played around with this. But, um, you know, sometimes these really intense emotional upheavals come up with ketamine. And sometimes um, patients don't always know what it's about. But, uh, you know, I've been able in therapy to have them invite that emotional experience back up. Let's say it's the day after ketamine, or maybe they're even still incredibly tearful from their ketamine the day before, and then do what in EMDR we would call a float back, you know, where they start with the body sensation and really lean into that and then float back to whatever experience is feeding that. Um, you know, they'll usually float back and end on a traumatic experience, and then we can move into some reprocessing of that. Interestingly enough, and this is kind of what I'd like to hear you share on, I find that sometimes the trauma that we float back to from ketamine is just the battle with mental health issues itself. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but I had, you know, just for example, a pretty young gal that's been dealing with OCD since she was eight um, have this real tearfulness come up during ketamine. It persisted for like 24 hours. We got her in to see me, um, and then when I took her to the body sensations, what that body sensation was about leading to this crying. It was about just frustration of having dealt with OCD and severe depression for so long. And so we were able to do some processing around that, which looked a lot like grief. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that might be just the first stepping stone on the journey. And it makes sense to go back to that first, but I would guess that there are some you know if you were to continue on the work there's some bigger and deeper things I remember working with one client also who had OCD and trauma we were in a group based ketamine setting and um, and I thought I knew her story pretty well but it turns out there were some traumatic things she'd never felt like she was able to share and they came up on ketamine ketamine is is uh, as a therapy accelerator and as a um, psychedelic type medicine creates this space where stuff can come out, right? Uh, takes you outside of the body where the fight or flight response is strong and uh, greases the wheels of therapy uh, and lets you go back there even sometimes when you're not planning on it. I've seen that uh, plenty. But during the ketamine session, uh, she started re experiencing. Uh, two different traumas actually that had happened in her life and uh, we were able to you know support her through that hold space encourage uh, you know that adage we use a lot you got to feel it to heal it let's uh, let's uh, keep going there within their window of tolerance and it was amazing what happened next having been able to talk about uh, not just one but two big significant traumas uh, for the first time in her life that she was I remember sitting with her the next day, uh, saying, "Do you uh, do you remember, you know, this part of the session?" And um, and she had had uh, some recollection. You you could tell she was embarrassed that it came up at first, but then so liberated too. I could see it in her 
in her eyes, heard in her voice, and in her posture that she had just uh, shed these big rocks that she was carrying around in her backpack for so many years uh, because uh, ketamine was able to facilitate uh, her retelling of that. Yeah. There's a huge exposure aspect to that part of treatment, it sounds like, because what you describe reminds me of some of the relief that some of my clients have had with exposure therapy, either for OCD, yeah. or for phobias, or for PTSD. And ketamine helps, it sounds like, people take a step in outside of the comfort zone into that fog of pain um, that they've been bouncing off of that's yeah. kept their comfort zone really small um, that it would be really hard to do otherwise. Yeah, so th so I think, uh, like like you pointed out earlier, you do have to work hard with the intentions and the focus and the skilled therapeutic support to go into the trauma work uh, in the right places and the right steps. Um, uh, but uh, it is a powerful medicine in you know, kind of facilitating that work um, and letting it come up in a safe way. Yeah. Yes. Yep. I had a client that I had worked with for a year with very little progress, trying to plant some seeds of maybe look into this ketamine therapy. And she finally started doing it. And I just knew in the back of my mind, I'm like, I know you have early childhood trauma. Um, you don't feel like you're a burden to your family at age 30 for asking, you know, for a small favor from your parents and have that lead to this severe debilitating depression. There has to be something there. Her very first ketamine session took her there mm -hmm. to the childhood trauma and it was like, yes, yeah, yeah. so it's yeah, a remember, great tool. I had, had a client come out of ketamine bawling his eyes out and this is the first time I'd seen him cry. And he just kept saying, I can't stop crying and I don't know why. Like, so ketamine brought him to his feelings but it didn't necessarily show him why they were there. Mm -hmm. But he hadn't been able to touch the feelings yet mm -hmm. in therapy. That's so. that reservoir of sadness that you yeah. were talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you were asking about how to approach the, tr the work with trauma and ketamine in particular. And mm -hmm. I think that's a big part of it. A couple things come to mind is one is reconnecting with your emotions mm -hmm. that have become confused or numbed out through the course of, uh, you know, out of necessity. Uh, because of the trauma, stress, and other wounds. And then the other thing is uh, we have a chance in ketamine-assisted psychotherapy, we have this honor and opportunity to help with corrective experiences. Going in and uh, showing someone that it's okay to feel, to cry, to take up space, and to ask for help. Mm -hmm. and, and having them experience that in little ways can lead to, like, big shifts and positive changes in life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I know. So I, my first ayahuasca experience was very much that, a corrective experience of that type, where I was, um, they had a quiet room reserved for people <laughs> who might be a little bit disruptive. And I remember going in thinking, oh, I wonder who the poor bastard is they're going to stuff into the quiet room. Well, guess who, <laughs> guess who went into the quiet room? Because not that I was like wailing and stuff. I was actually uh, having a very pleasant experience. I was just very vocal and, and loud about it. <laughs> and I remember after ceremony starting to feel self-conscious, like, oh man, I must have been super annoying. I probably disrupted other people's experiences. But to have everybody be so loving uh, toward me afterward sure. and some, it just, it was a corrective experience knowing that I could step into a vulnerable kind of in your face version of myself and um, run the risk of maybe putting some people off and it would be okay. Mm -hmm. And that was tremendously corrective. As Reed says, it was healing for me to just have that experience, not just to think that it's possible because I could have convinced myself, you know, some part of myself that that's possible, but to actually live it was, was huge. Right. I think about that as almost this redeveloping where we had trauma in critical phases of development, psychedelics and that um, nurturing through the guide, nurturing through community in ayahuasca, or even you know, if someone is processing a strong emotion of aloneness, 
being able to hold themselves through that in the psychedelic experience helps them redevelop um, with their needs met. Mm -hmm. I like that, redevelop. Yeah, and and, uh, there's also the family component. We've done a fair amount of like family-based psychedelic healing here uh, by having, say, parents and uh, a child with a serious condition uh, uh, come in together and do the work. Um, And it's amazing to see the corrective experiences that can come as you create the right container, lay down the the ground rules, and help help people open up, reconnect, uh, love and support each other in skillful ways that uh, makes makes a big impact in life afterwards. Yeah, that's something I'm really excited about with uh, MDMA is the couples work. I know that uh, couples treatment for PTSD is usually more productive than individual treatment for PTSD just because of how disruptive that condition is to a dyad, you know, to a family. And, um, but yeah, I'm really looking forward to being able to use that medicine for that purpose. Yeah, I was talking to some of the MDMA trainer supervisors who have been working with the medicine a very long time back to when it was legal and used in couples therapy and Mm -hmm. uh, I remember one of them said to me uh, MDMA is the best medicine to work with because uh, it makes you feel like the most amazing therapist and you don't have to do much other than get out of the way of the medicine hold hold safe space uh, and let the medicine and the inner healing intelligence work its magic Mm -hmm. Um, including in couples work that can be tricky really tricky <laughs> I, I I can't help myself. I wa- I was been watching Rick and Morty, mm-hmm. really bizarre cartoon. I love it. It's a good one. Um, and there's a couples therapy episode that I just watched last night. It's it'll take too long to describe, but it's just a shameless plug for Rick and Morty. If you want to go look, put it, it in the show notes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll follow the link to the show notes. Couples therapy is challenging. So challenging that this couple, you know, destroyed the intergalactic couples therapy association in Rick and Morty. Anyway. It could happen. Yeah. Guess tread, we did some MDMA. Tread carefully. Yeah, <laughs> tread carefully. Yeah, there was a recent study. It was done by Ann Wagner and colleagues in Toronto uh, where both couples got MDMA and uh, f- where one had trauma or PTSD. And mm-hmm. it was a really positive study, really exciting work. Um, and I'm excited to see more of that. Yeah, for sure. Any other thoughts around trauma? that you folks had in mind that you wanted to share with our delightful, benevolent audience? We could probably do a whole other episode. On Rick and Morty? Trauma mm-hmm. part two. <laughs> Trauma part two. It's, there's, there's no end to things to talk about. I mean, we all carry around varying degrees of trauma. I know I sure do. And trauma work as a therapist is some of the most rewarding work, but it's also some of the most draining work for me. Um, just because it's you know, it's most of us get into this profession because we give a shit about people. And mm-hmm. um, to do good trauma work, I think you have to to join with people. I mean, of course, appropriate psychological boundaries and everything. Um, it's one of the things that has drawn me to psychedelic medicine is uh, I can't wait for the backup. You know, I mean, ketamine has been incredible and yeah. I love using it. I'm just excited for these other medicines too. Um, for and we, we call it ketamine assisted th- psychotherapy for a reason, or some people call it ketamine accelerated or ketamine enhanced psychotherapy. Um, it's, we can get pretty jacked up, we human beings. <laughs> and so to have these compounds, these medicines, these plants, these teachers, these chemical teachers to uh, help the therapeutic community help others means the freaking world to me. I'm just, I'm thrilled about it. Yeah. The, I like what you said, and the the thing that comes to mind that I'll add is the importance of doing our own work mm-hmm. as healers uh, and potentially as wounded healers because, you know, we all have our own stress, and it is a very challenging and taxing work. I remember um, early in my career I was working for a few years with uh, – torture victim refugees human trafficking subjects hearing their stories and and trying my best to hold them and stay um, you know strong and grounded 
as they retold their story. And I remember uh, coming out of the room once and the nurse I was working with said, are you okay? You look at you like you've seen a ghost. Mm. Because there were some atrocities that uh, these individuals were holding on to uh, that they were, you know, entrusting me with as their as their clinician, um, and it just highlighted to me the, the need to really kind of build that capacity in oneself to hold hold suffering, you know, our own and that of others, um, and we do that by doing our own healing work. Yeah, that's such an important yeah. point to bring up. I think a trauma therapist, too, is also responsible to model what healthy attachment looks like, and so it's important to have done one's own work to even know what that is and to be able to to recognize what unmet needs are there in your client um, when they they obviously don't have any idea Mm -hmm. yeah and that's not to say you need to be a fully self-actualized ubermensch in order to Mm -hmm. be a therapist but we do need to do our own work Um, I think uh, we should do an episode on burnout uh, clinician burnout because you know you'll notice that if you start cutting your heartstrings so that you can do the work that uh, pretty quickly it's going to go downhill. You know, if you, if you become jaded or really compartmentalize. I remember talking to a uh, family practice doc who was like, you're a therapist, right? I need to send more people to you. I, I, I keep telling my patients, I'm the pill guy. I'm not the feelings guy. Don't talk to me about <laughs> your feelings. And at first I was like, ew. And then I was like, oh, it's got to be really, really hard to do what you do. So, yeah, let, that's, uh, let's put that on the agenda, folks. That would be a really <laughs> good topic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think so. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, yeah, Hannah, thank for being you with both. us. You're welcome. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you for joining us today. Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers is brought to you by Novamind, a mental health company that specializes in psychedelic medicine and research. You can learn more about Novamind's mission to increase access to legal, safe, and evidence-based psychedelic medicine at novamind.ca. If you like what you heard today, please subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you're using to listen or watch. Also, if you're feeling generous today, please leave us a glowing review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you like to listen. This will help us get into the ears and faces of more people and help us put wind in the sails of the psychedelic medicine renaissance. Thanks for listening.